I will say that he is a breast cancer surgeon and researcher at Wayne State University, and also, oh my goodness, managing editor of the popular blog, Science Based Medicine. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, Dr. David Gorski. Do -do 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 -do. I don't usually get anyone like dancing for me when they introduce me, so thanks. <laughs> All right. Um, I have a, first off, I'd like to thank Skepticon for inviting me because when the invitation came in the, in the email, I kind of scratched my head and said, is this right? Uh, because, you know, I hadn't really, really thought of Skepticon as a place that would want to hear about alternative medicine and that sort of thing. But apparently they do. My second question was, you really want Steve Novella, right? But no, 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 they wanted me for some reason, so we'll, you're stuck with me, and hopefully we can talk about some stuff that'll be, be a bit thought-provoking. First off, obligatory plug, sciencebasedmedicine.org. Also, the Society for Science-Based Medicine, of which I am chairman of the board, is a group dedicated to combating pseudoscience in medicine. And pseudoscience in medicine is a big problem, as uh, I hope I'll partially show you. Now, I don't really need to talk about what dogma is to a group like you, really, do I? However, if, you're not, if you don't have a background in biology, you might not know that there's something in molecular biology called the central dogma. Serious? Um, and, and, you know, I hated that term even back before I became a bit of a heathen. Uh, but that, it, it dates back to the 70s, and it basically says that you know, D information, genetic information coded in self-replicating DNA undergoes unidirectional transfer to messenger RNAs that are then transcribed into proteins. It's very simple. It's also <laughs> lots and lots of exceptions. Basically, as it was taught to me, it is um, DNA makes, R makes uh, RNA makes protein. Of course, we now know there are, it's way more complicated than that. Um, that was like a 1960s understanding. You know, there are complex networks of gene interactions. There are RNAs that don't code for any protein, but they do regulate gene expression. There's revert, you know, there's RNA that codes genetic information. It, it, but I think this will strengthen the analogy a bit in my overall question, because as I was thinking about what I was going to talk about for Skepticon, I was like, well, I don't think I could just do my usual cancer quackery talk. I don't know if that would interest you. Um, or maybe it would. But I did do a post a couple of years ago that I happened to come across asking the question, is there a central dogma in alternative medicine? Um, and I think that you can say that there is if with the... Um, exceptions, you know, the kind of, in other words, it's a central dogma in alternative medicine the same way the central dogma of molecular biology is a dogma of molecular biology. I think it, set, it gives an actual truth, but, you know, like I said, a lot of exceptions. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you some really quacky stuff, okay? Um, and of course, Deepak Chopra is mentioned at least a couple of times. <laughs> um, but my point that I want you to get is, if this were just a bunch of quacks, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. But this sort of thinking is through the infiltration, it, it, it's infiltrating itself into mainstream medicine, along with the quackery. It, you know, I have a term for quackery and mainstream medicine. Um, I can't claim to have invented it. I wish I did. But it's called quackademic medicine. <laughs> uh, but I like to think I popularized it. But I'll, let's start up, for, but some of you may not be aware of this. So let's take a look at what I like to call the evolution of quackery. You've probably all seen this Ascent of Man sort of image, you know, um, it, to, used often to represent a shorthand for evolution. For the evolution of quackery, I prefer this one. <laughs> <coughs> it starts out with folk medicine. Now, you can't criticize folk medicine too much in its context hundreds of years ago. They didn't have anything better. But when folk medicine persists beyond a point of time when 
it should have be realized that it doesn't work, or, mu or much of it doesn't work, and, in, and takes on characteristics of the society, you know, of a more modern society, we called it quackery. And this is what we called it back, like, until the 1960s or 70s or so. And then something happened. It became alternative medicine. It's an alternative. It's almost like it's, it's an alternative to medicine. Uh, it isn't, but uh, it sounds that way. But that wasn't good enough um, because it still sounds like it's a subsidiary position. So in the, late, in the 80s and 90s, a term was coined complementary and alternative medicine, or CAM, which I frequently use because CAM is easier than saying some of the other terms. Um, it's a complement. You, know, you use it in addition to real medicine. However, that still wasn't good enough. So we come up now, and this is the preferred term now among its advocates, integrative medicine. You're integrating the quackery <laughs> with science-based medicine. And, and I'm not kidding. Um, as you'll see, in a, in a, I'll show a couple examples, but basically you are, you know, you're integrating pseudoscience with science. And it's the best of both worlds. It gives the impression, it's a term that says, oh, this is co-equal. You know, you're taking the best of both worlds and they're roughly equal and it, isn't this awesome? And, and, and it's represented by someone that we all know and love, uh, Andrew Weil, if you haven't seen him. Um, you know, an old hippie who, who, very cuddly, very much into this. So what does, like I, I like to say this, what does integrative medicine equal? It equals. Science, scientific medicine, plus magic. <laughs> That's Dr. Strange. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of the younger people might not know who that is, so we'll try that. <laughs> but that still might be too old of a reference, so there we go. <laughs> but it is. It's integrating medicine with magic. Now, alternative medicine, <coughs> excuse me, there's a lot to alternative medicine. And in fact, this comes from the definitions of alternative medicine, the, the way that the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine divides the forms of alternative medicine. Yes, there is a National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine, NCAM for short. Your tax dollars at work, about 100 million, 120 million a year. Um, and you have various processes. Biologically based processes, I like to say, are drugs. They're like herbs and supplements. They're adulterated and impure and drugs whose efficacy is unknown, but if they work, they're drugs. The rest is a lot of magic. Uh, energy therapies, which I'll talk about. Homeopathy, which I won't. I wanted to, but I had to cut it for length reasons. You know, mind-body interaction, spirituality, all of that. Now here's what originally got me thinking about this topic, and I'm going to play a brief clip of everybody's favorite, and I'm just gonna s shut up and let Oprah talk. Is that loud enough? Note the look on Oprah's face. Okay, so I got that email and I said I wanted to come here because I think that, uh, you know, I'm really happy that the message, <coughs> or certainly some of the messages of the secret is reaching mass consciousness in a way that people realize that they can begin to uh, positively affect their lives. That's why when I was on the show and I said I've lived this way my whole life, and people who've watched our show for years know that I've been talking about how you take responsibility for your life and the choices that you 
Okay, whoever thought that Oprah would be the voice of reason in this? But that's, you know, but that's a reaction. We will revisit Kim Tinkham in a little while. But the reason Kim Tinkham was interested in The Secret was because of Oprah. About a month before she sent that email to Oprah, Oprah had her infamous episode about in which she promoted The Secret. And The Secret, you know, is based, you know, it was basically codified in a book by Rhonda Byrne back, uh, God, almost 10 years ago now. And it's a very much wishful thinking kind of, dare I say, religious sort of thing. Um, basically, the secret is, boiled down to its essence, is something called the law of attraction. And to give you an idea of what the law of attraction says, here's a couple of quotes. Thoughts become things. Not really, uh, but you know, th th this is what she says. But thoughts are, this is the key, I think. Thoughts are magnetic, and they have a frequency. As you think, those thoughts are sent out into the universe, and they magnetically attract all like things that are on the same frequency. Everything sent out returns to its source, and that source is you. Now, on a trivial level, this is kind of true. You, you can't get what you want if you don't want it in the first place. But, you know, action is required. But I translate it as to wishing makes it so, which is basically what she's saying. If you want something hard enough, the universe will give it to you, right? Um, it's basically childish wish fulfillment, the belief that if you want something badly enough, you will get it. Um, and it, and it is kind of religious because you could substitute God or whatever, and if you wish for it bad enough, it will be provided. So what this got me to thinking of, and I could fall flat on my face on this, but I don't care, it dawned on me that the law of attraction is the central dogma of alternative medicine. Let, let's have another quote from uh, Byrne. You cannot catch anything unless you think you can. And thinking you can is inviting it to you with your thought. You are also inviting illness if you are listening to people talk about their illnesses. You laugh? But illness cannot exist in a body that has harmonious thoughts. There, there's the, in the same interview, Byrne said that she believes that if someone has cancer, she could cure him, herself by laughing. The author actually was smart. The author noted that if the converse of this, that, that this implies the converse is true, that their cancer had been caused by negative thoughts, right? She also said if someone is fat, um, yes, you can't think thin, you cannot think thin thoughts and be fat, she says. Now let's take a look at some alternative medicine and you'll see if some of this sort of thinking comes in. My, fav my second favorite form of alternative medicine uh, is for pure ridiculousness. Uh, my, first being my first favorite being homeopathy. But my second favorite is energy medicine. Does people know what Reiki is? So I'm, okay, I'll tell you what it really is in a second. But I think it's appropriate first to note that religion has always been part of medicine. In the very, the very beginnings of medicine are intertwined with ideas that belief can cure. In ancient Egypt, for instance, priests were physicians and physicians were priests. They two were one. It was the same profession. Most medicine had a healthy dose of prayer because it was, the gods made you sick, so you got to pray to the gods to get better. Um, Certainly they didn't have much that would get you better aside from that. Most people either got better or they didn't. Um, you also have to remember that until pretty darn recently, like the, 18, you know, 19, the 18th and 19th centuries, physicians really knew very little about disease mechanisms. Germ theory wasn't even really accepted until the late 1800s. Um, and, <coughs> excuse me. Even into like the early 20th century, medicine 
could be viewed as almost as, you know, as likely to hurt you as help you, which is part of the reason, by the way, why homeopathy actually seemed to do better than conventional medicine back in the early 1800s. We also have magic and prayer-based medicine now. I mean, Dr. Oz, you know? <laughs> That's John Edward, if you can't see in the back seat, sitting with Dr. Oz. And then on the right there, it's uh, Teresa Caputo sitting with him. And he's actually had shows where he says, psychic mediums, are they the new therapists? Um, and in fact, on the lower right-hand corner is an actual faith healer uh, by the name of, um, oh, his name is Dr. Neme. I'm sorry, I almost forgot. So, the, you know, there's a lot of religious-based medicine going on right this day. So let's take a look at Reiki. It was originated by Dr. Makao Usui in Japan. Um, it stands, it's, the practitioners claim to be able to channel energy from the universal source and direct that, ener uh, direct that energy into the patient or the recipient for healing effect. It may or may not involve touching. Uh, it, it's pure magical thinking. And in fact, it is derived from religion. Uh, there was, in one of the origin stories of Reiki, it, it reads, Dr. Usui realized that he must find out how Jesus healed. This immediately set him on a journey of many years, studying first at Christian schools in the US with no results. Someone suggested Buddhist writings that since the Buddha also healed, that, that, he could, that there must be a way to heal. This meant more years at monasteries. Nowhere could he find the answers. After many years of study, he went to a mountain declaring his intention to fast and meditate for 21 days, and that if he did not come back, they should come and get his body. When he came down from that mountain, he could do Reiki, or so the legend goes. I know this is an obnoxious picture, <laughs> but they all seem to be that way on all the Reiki sites I look for. Besides, I thought I'd co-opt it for my own purposes. So let's look at faith healing, for instance, because that's what Reiki is. In Christian belief, <laughs> you have God, and the healer prays to God, and you get his healing energy coming down and healing the patient. In Reiki, that's no good. Not, not for this, no. Instead, we have the universal source. Look how purple and awesome it is. <laughs> and instead, we get the, the, the purple energy coming through and healing the patient. Is there any difference? Reiki is faith healing. But I'll go one step further than that. <coughs> well, you know, while I'm having a little bit of fun, there is such a thing called distance healing or sending Reiki over distances. They really say they can do that. Some, sometimes they'll even do it over the phone for you for a fee. <laughs> they can send it anywhere in the world. So does that remind you of something? Yes, it's intercessory prayer, basically. Now, it goes further than that. I love this article. Yes, you can project Reiki energy into the future or the past. <laughs> and, and some of the examples are awesome. I mean, think of a, a few examples include sending it into the future before a, a scheduled surgical procedure or an upcoming court session. Yeah, they actually said that. Walking into an interview, a meeting hall, a courtroom, a new school, maybe, maybe I projected some Reiki energy to just before I started talking here. Right. And I love this line. It says, you know, walking into an interview, a meeting hall, a courtroom, a new school, a social gathering, or anywhere else is less intimidating when Reiki energies you sent previously greet you at the door. I wonder what that would look like, Reiki energies greeting me at the door. You can also send it backward in time. Simply use your intent, intent, you know, thinking makes it so, to a specific past event. Or focus your healing energies on your inner child at the exact moment she was injured years previously. I mean, what is this? The TARDIS? 
<coughs> but here's where, here's what really pisses me off. You can find Reiki practitioners in many, many, many hospitals, including some of the most res respectable hospitals in the country. For instance, this is, this is actual quotes from the Cleveland Clinic website. It says Reiki may, okay, bring a peaceful, deep relaxation. Having someone pay attention to you and wave your hands over you, maybe that's true. Dissolve energy blockages, whatever that means. Detoxify your body. Now, I have a whole talk on detoxification, you know, and how it's utter nonsense. Maybe I'll give it some time. Supply the, of course, supply the universal life force energy to the body. This is on the Cleveland Clinic website, okay? Stimulate the body's immune system. That's an all-purpose quack claim. Stimulate bone and tissue healing. I, I love this one. Increase the vibrational frequency of the client on physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual levels. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> Lots of places have Reiki. University of Arizona, Cleveland Clinic, some, of, some really respectable cancer centers. Reiki practitioners are everywhere. Does anyone know what ger German new medicine is? Probably not very many. That's fortunate, because it's a really, really horrible quackery. But, <coughs> excuse me, I think it illustrates my point. Um, This was invented by a guy by the name of Reich Hammer, who was a doctor. He, had, he suffered a tragic incident, and, and you can't make stuff like this up. His son Dirk was shot by the son of the last king of Italy while asleep on a yacht. His son died you know, a few months later, and um, Dr. Hammer went off the deep end. That's when he came up with German New Medicine. One of his famous quotes is, nothing in nature is ever diseased, but always meaningful. So in other words, all your diseases are meaningful. He came up with five what he, um, laws that he calls them. One thing about quack, one way to recognize a quack, if they have a bunch of laws or rules that they say never vary, Pretty good indication. But his first law, and this is where the thinking makes it so comes in, cancer originates from a psychic trauma or conflict of some kind. And in fact, this trauma leads to something that he called a Durkheimer foci, which are lesions that you supposedly can see on CT scan that correspond to the location of the disease in the body. Suffice to say, you know, no one's ever shown that these things exist, but that's the claim. But the bottom line is, cancer is not cells gone amok in your body to him. It is psychic trauma. And this is, like a com this is a fairly common theme in some alternative medicines. You may think I've cherry picked, and to some extent I have because I only have 50 minutes, but you'll hear, this comes over and over again. There's, so the way you cure this disease is you have to confront it and overcome this psychic trauma. You know, yeah, thinking makes it so. The third law is just basically reflexology. In other words, it's just basically how he claims that the Durkheimer foci map to various parts of the body. A little less said of that, the better. This one's batshit out there. Basically, the idea is that when you're healing yourself, that, the, that my, your brain controls the microbes in your body to help eliminate the cancer. And then, God, I hate this one. All diseases are rational and for your benefit. No. The universe doesn't care if you live or you die. Dying of cancer is unfortunately very, very natural. So, 
you know, basically this, the bottom line to summarize this is cancer is psychosomatic and you have to overcome your, your mental state in order to um, overcome the cancer. Thinking makes it so. Placebo effects. Per, perhaps the most irritating new development in alternative medicine and CAM is the massive overselling of placebo effects. In a way, I can't blame them for doing this. The reason being that um, more and more studies show that their stuff doesn't work. So it's placebo. If you feel better from most alternative medicine, it's placebo effect. So they co-opt the placebo effect. That's how it works. It's the powerful placebo. That's what's making you better. My friend Mark Chrislip likes to call placebos uh, obnoxiously, but then that's Mark sometimes. The beer goggles of medicine. <laughs> <coughs> because it's all about perception, and rather than any actual, if you'll excuse the term, meaningful effect on physiology. And this sort of thinking is creeping not just is not just in alternative medicine, it's creeping out everywhere. Let's take a look at this. Placebos, you can find, I just picked these. I mean, I could have found, I could have loaded several slides with these sorts of things. The power of nothing, how placebos, you know, heal. Why placebos work wonders. The powerful placebo from ancient priest to modern physician. Well, that, that's actually somewhat appropriate. I was a little disappointed that first one is Michael Spector, who normally does a much better job as far as critical thinking. So placebo basically means, it's basically nonspecific effects that, that have to be controlled for in clinical trials. And, and we know that, and it's, this is particularly true for subjective outcomes, pain, anxiety, that sort of thing. Um, and to some extent, it's an artifact of clinical trials the way clinical trials are done, the way they're reported. After all, if your drug doesn't do better than a placebo, your drug doesn't work, okay? And there is bias, it's, and it's not intentional bias. Bias is incredibly hard to get out of, you know, to design a clinical trial to avoid. And a lot of it's reporting bias. Perception, obviously. There's, there's, this, there's some idea that this has to do with conditioning, you know, like you get conditioned that you expect, you see certain things you expect that they will do you good. And then, of course, like I said, the expectancy effects. Basically, the idea being, for instance, you, ha you, you learn to get an expectation when you see various things, such as the needle about to give you the drug or a pill or even just a physician in a lab coat, and that leads to your brain perceiving more, you know, that you, that you feel better. And that if you take away some of those cues, the placebo effect is either eliminated or greatly decreased. When you look at placebos critically, um, they're not, there's not nearly as much there as is being sold. This is, this is, um, a comprehensive, I'm sorry, a systematic review from 2001, which basically found, concluded, we found little evidence in general that placebos have powerful uh, clinical effects, although placebos had no significant effects on objective or binary outcomes. Dead, not dead. That's a binary outcome. Tumor goes away. Tumor doesn't go away. Binary outcome. They had possible small benefits in studies with continuous subjective outcomes and for the treatment of pain. Outside the setting of clinical trials, there is no justification for the use of placebos. And in fact, that's this is basically the same thing that the Cochrane Review from 2010 says. And, <coughs> excuse me, I'll try to illustrate this with a clinical trial that was published about three years ago. The idea was this. Do, do placebos cause a physiologic effect in patients with asthma. So to, to boil the study down, and this is the first result, and this is sort of what you would, you would basically expect. They use albuterol, an effective treatment for an asthma attack, versus placebo, versus sham acupuncture. Now, 
I could go on and on. I could do a whole talk about acupuncture and sham acupuncture. Suffi suffice to say, they were looking to see if a different kind of placebo, but quick thing about acupuncture I can't resist. It doesn't matter where you put the needles in. It doesn't matter if you put the needles in. You get the same effect. So how do you tell sham acupuncture? The idea is they, it's acupuncture where they put it in the wrong spot or they use these retractable needles that don't actually penetrate the skin. And then there was a no intervention control, do nothing. And this is what you would expect. This is FEV1, uh, forced expiratory volume in one second, which is a common measurement of how bad your asthma is. The higher it is, the better. The lower it is, the worse your asthma attack is. And as you expect, placebo, sham, no intervention, basically nothing, you know, no effect. But the albuterol worked, because we know it does. This is the perception the patients reported, or the subjects reported. And notice that the placebo and the sham acupuncture, the two placebo groups, they said they felt as good as the patients who got the albuterol. Now, I'm going to do what Steve Novella did a few years ago, and we use this very same thing. <laughs> placebo makes you think you feel better but it doesn't really do much for physiology. And this is dangerous. For this, this is dangerous. You could, you could be in one of those two placebo groups and think you're perfectly fine and your FEV1 is down there. And you could have a respiratory arrest and die. So, placebo effect, <laughs> there, there's, there's something perhaps to, object, or to subjective outcomes, but objective outcomes, no. Now let's see what some of the things that alternative medicine people say about placebo effects. Okay. A lot of times it's represented as proof that your thoughts and beliefs can cause self-healing. And this Andre Evans, and, and I'm going to read a couple of these. I'm just going to go through some quotes because they're, they illustrate my point better than I could just telling you. So, the power of the mind is immense. Its influence can literally bend reality to match its perspective. You can often influence a situation more by thinking about it meticulously as opposed to simply acting. Really? If you would believe something to be true, you will conform the world around you to match this expectation. No, if you believe something to be true, you'll act on it, right? <laughs> but it gets better. If you believe that your illness is getting worse, it will probably get worse. If you believe that your treatment is helping you, you could actually cause a massive self-healing to occur. Assuming a disposition that will automatically prejudice your mind and therefore cause your body to react positively or negatively. <sighs> Huffington Post did one better. I've never, I never heard of this guy before I found this article, but he actually wrote an article about how the placebo effect proves that God exists. <coughs> and I suspect you will like what comes next. Well, for humor's sake. The placebo effect is arguably the most underrated discovery of modern medicine. Replace just the placebo effect with the amazing placebo effect. The mind-boggling placebo effect. To my way of thinking, the very existence of this mysterious effect proves that God exists. That's right, you can find evidence for the foundational truths taught by religion in virtually every double-blind medical research study. <laughs> oh, it gets better. <laughs> Which brings us to the placebo effect. It is mysterious, right? No, we just don't fully understand it yet. We don't know how it happens. A person was sick and they take a sugar pill and the next thing you know, voila, they're healthy. No, it doesn't work like that. To call this the placebo effect is to dress up our ignorance in words. What, is actually, what has actually happened is nothing short of a miracle. Science has gotten no explanation for it. Something immaterial, a thought, has impacted something material our body in a way that, which utterly defies logic. 
have to stop for a second. <laughs> Soak that in. But there's a more benign version of this. You know, this is, I picked these because admittedly they're batshit crazy. <laughs> you know, there's a, you know, but, but the same thinking goes into this. And this is Bernie Siegel, whom you may have heard of. He's made a big name for himself in, you know, humanizing medicine, you know, patient-doctor interaction. Unfortunately, he also believes in a lot of woo, such as homeopathy and energy healing. But he says, I was a pediatric surgeon and a general surgeon, my kind of people. And I know how powerful my words were to the children and adults who believed in me. I had no problem deceiving the children into health by labeling the vitamin pills as medications to prevent nausea and hair loss, or telling them the alcohol sponge would numb their skin, and of, and of course sharing this with their parents who helped empower the child's belief. The mind and attitude are powerful healing processes. He actually brings up an interesting point. Placebo, if you're going to try to use placebo effect, it inherently requires deception. You got to tell the patient that nothing, that something will do something that it won't. And you know, for instance, one researcher who's big on placebo, Ted Kapchuk, once claimed he had shown that you could do placebo without deception, like you could invoke the placebo effect without deception. No, he couldn't. He basically, if you look at the consent form, it says placebos have powerful mind-body effects. I think we have enough placebo for the moment. Let's move to epigenetics. I guarantee you, if there are any molecular biologists out there, be careful, your brain's going to explode with some of this stuff. <laughs> but first, for those of you who are not molecular biologists, this is like the one minute introduction to epigenetics. I mean, it's basically things that happen to DNA that can affect gene expression that can be heritable. So, for instance, you know, things that happen in development, things that happen in the environment, um, aging, you know, various other things can cause, for instance, methylation of the DNA. It can cause changes in the histones that, around which the DNA is wrapped. Um, it's important in cancer. It's important in a variety of other diseases. Um, in fact, HDAC inhibitors, histine, histone deacetylase uh, inhibitors are a hot area in cancer research. These <coughs> Excuse me. These are, um, you know, it, it, it's basically we, it, a hot new area uh, that has be, unfortunately been co-opted. Um, and the problem is, you know, it's always oversold. Most of these changes don't persist more than a generation or two, and, and, the, and the evidence for them in humans is a little bit sketchy. But that doesn't stop it from showing up in things like this. Um, in Der Spiegel from like 2010, you see, see this, okay, you got this, this beautiful Nordic woman rising from the water with the water going around her, just like a double helix covering her naughty bits, barely. And what, what this means, those of you who read German already know, but for those of you who don't, the victory over the genes, smarter, healthier, happier, how we can outwit our genomes. The message is that we control our genome through epigenetics. We do. And if you believe some of this stuff, epigenetics is magic. For instance, you have happiness genes, unlocking the potential he hidden in your DNA. The biology of belief, how your belief can change your DNA through epigenetics. This is Bruce Lipton. Anyone heard of Bruce Lipton? I'm sure some of you have. I like to think of him as a cell biologist who's gone bad. <laughs> and of course, Deepak Chopra, who almost a year, a year ago declared that the big idea in 2014 is that you will transform your own biology. If you search Mercola.com, one of the quackiest sites on the internet, you will find um, all sorts of things on epigenetics, with titles like how your mind can reprogram your genes, how your thoughts can cause or cure cancer, why your DNA is not your destiny. If you listen to Bruce Lipton, be prepared for brain explosions. Okay, 
has modern science bankrupted our souls? Maybe, but that doesn't prove what he says about epigenetics means anything. But let's see it anyway. The exciting new science of epigenetics emphasizes genes are controlled by the environment and more importantly by our perception of the environment. Epigenetics acknowledges that we are not victims, but masters. For we can change our environment or perceptions and create up to 30,000 variations for each of our genes. Okay, next, Deepak Chopra, of course. Here's what he said in this article. The new model, however, portrays a more fluid, dynamic genome that responds quickly, even instantly, to all that we experience, including how you think, feel, speak, and act. Every day brings new evidence that the mind-body connection reaches right down to the activities of our genes. How this activity changes in response to our life experiences is referred to as epigenetics. No, it's not. Regardless of the nature of the genes we inherit from our parents, dynamic change at this level allows us almost unlimited influence on our fate. I'd like to see him prove that. Live forever. Or at least past 100. One more. This means that control is being given back to each person. We are no longer seen as puppets of our DNA. You'll hear a lot of this. Like, they really, really hate genetic determinism, okay? It, 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 they really hate it. The human genome is set to be the stage for future evolution that we ourselves direct. Okay, so not only can you cure yourself, but you can direct the evolution of the human race. Making choice an integral part of genetics. This is in stark contrast to the biology as destiny view, where genes override choice. Unless decisions, lifestyle, environment, and personal preferences are included, a full picture of the mysteries of our DNA cannot be attained. <sighs> he even has a research initiative to test this sort of stuff. Can meditation alter biology? It's basically <coughs> a randomized trial where some people who go to his, his retreat and do all sorts of the meditation and the diet stuff that he does are compared to a bunch of people who don't go to his retreat. Nothing blinded, by the way. And they basically go on a massive fishing expedition for like gene changes, all sorts of marker changes. And anyone who knows anything about statistics knows that if you look at enough things simultaneously, by random chance alone, you're gonna find some that are positive. And worse, there are some pretty respectable institutions collaborating with him on this. What it all boils down to is, you must believe. Wishing might make it so, but not unless you believe. Um, and I think this, is, this comes from a deep-seated need to have an explanation for everything. Um, I ha patients frequently come up to me and say, why did I, or, you know, when, he, when you give them the news, which is always hard, they'll say, why, did, why me? Why did I get breast cancer? And they're seldom satisfied with the answer that I give them, because even though it's true, which is that only about 15% come of breast cancer is genetic in terms of, you know, family history or, or a gene mutation that we can identify, and that most environmental influences on breast cancer risk are actually fairly modest compared to bio, you know, various biological aspects, and that a lot of it unfortunately boils down to bad luck with respect to biology. We don't like that. You can hear it. And, and, and I'll quote Chopra again in a second to show you exactly what I mean. We want to know why, which is all a good thing, except sometimes there isn't really a why. So I think, here, quoting Deepak Chopra again from an article he did in the Huff, Huffington Post, is evolution ready to evolve? Um, <coughs> a person can be left at peace with randomness, natural selection, a universe where the only conscious beings are us, and so on. But most people also gravitate toward the idea of choosing their own future. 
It's more optimistic than resigning yourself to the mechanical operation of fate or stand-ins like all controlling genes. I couldn't have said it better myself, except that this is, wishful thinking is not a basis for medicine or biology. Now, where do you think this came from? I'm going to read it briefly, and I'm going to see, see if you... It says, great care should be taken with reluctant or overly skeptical patients who are suffering from pathologies or are under the allopathic care system. These individuals do not understand the alternative healing paradigm and are not prepared to undergo the rigors of detoxification. Okay. This came from, an, from the owner's manual of something called Ion Cleanse Premier. Does anyone know what that is? It's one of those foot baths <laughs> that says, you know, that, that they run a current through and say it's pulling toxins out through your feet. By the way, and, and I'm, I'm sure most of you know this, the water still turns disgusting brown even if the feet aren't in there. <clears throat> I'm going to pick on Bill Maher for a second. I'm good at that. <laughs> Way back when, he, was, he had an episode of Real Time with Bill Maher. And they were talking about the flu. And he was spewing his usual bullshit about how the flu vaccine doesn't work, how it's really, you know, aggregate toxicity, how if your body is, you know, properly cared for, and you think the right thoughts and eat the right foods and do the right exercises, you can't get the flu and you don't need the vaccine. And in fact, he came down to one line, which they were talking about, well, what if you're in an airplane and all these people hacking around, you know, you get the flu. He said, I would never get flu on an airplane, presumably because he does the right things, eats the right foods, does the right exercises, thinks the right thoughts. Bob Costas, of all people, was on this show. And he has the perfect response to anyone who ever says something like that. <laughs> oh, come on, Superman. <coughs> and after that, this is hilarious, Bill Maher looked around and he's like, you're all looking at me like I'm crazy. Yes, we are. <laughs> but unfortunately, I have to wrap up my talk with coming back, doing what I said and coming back to Kim Tinkham. So, to recap, she was diagnosed with stage three breast cancer in early 2007. She decided to forego all conventional therapy, including surgery. At one point, she claimed her tumor was gone based on a blood test that's not validated for that, and she even admitted at the time that she could still feel the tumor. But she said, I know it's inert and can't harm me. So what did she choose instead? Anyone ever heard of Robert O. Young? No? His, his thing is, acid causes all cancer. Or as I like to say, acid is the disease, alkalinization is the cure for everything. Um, he says there's no such thing as a cancer cell. The cancer cell is once a healthy cell that has been spoiled by acid, and the cancer is actually a protective reaction to that cell. So if you get rid of the acid, the protective reaction is not necessary anymore. The tumor isn't the problem to him. It's the solution. You know, and, and you know, these are his websites, if, if anyone's interested. Now, what does he also say? You know, he wrote this article. Can positive or negative thoughts and emotions affect, you know, your spirit, your health? <laughs> and here's what he says. My theory of one sickness, one disease, and one health are set forth in what I call the new biology. And not only considers how our diet affects our physiology, but how our psychology affects our physiology and how our psychology affects our spirituality. Your thoughts are critical. Your thoughts or words do become matter and can affect your physiology in a negative or positive way. Your thoughts do become biology. Unfortunately, not for Kim Tinkham. Back in November, late November 2010, I noticed some messages popping up 
uh, caring for Kim. And, and, and investigating it, I found out that her cancer had, it wasn't, I had to read between the lines, but basically it sounded like her cancer had spread to her liver and that she was in bad shape. Um, and a week or two later, this message came up, caring for Kim, you know, Kim has passed. Now, thinking positive thoughts, you know, doing all this quackery, it didn't save her. Um, does anyone think that she didn't want to live? Or that she didn't really want to live? Here's the problem with the secret, and you, and, and, and I'm going to Godwin it, okay? Did the victim, ask yourself this, did the victims of the Holocaust attract the horror to them? Because that's what the secret says, that's the flip side of the secret. If you attract good things to yourself through your mental will, then if bad things happen to you, it must be because you willed it so. Um, as I, or as I say, and this is, a lot of this is in alternative medicine. If wishing makes it so, getting sick means you attracted it to yourself. Not getting better means you didn't want it bad enough. Or if wishing makes it so, not getting better means you didn't believe enough in the cure or that you didn't follow the protocol enough. What did Robert O. Young say? Now this, this showed up on, uh, on a comment on his YouTube page, which has since been scrubbed, but I've saved it for posterity at the time. He said, and this was, now this is a secondhand account from someone who emailed him, but I believe it. Called me a few weeks to tell me that she was, sorry, sorry, that, obviously I missed something. She called me a few weeks ago to tell me that she had breast surgery and that her cancer was now in other parts of her body. She felt embarrassed to tell me this news because she had not been living an alkaline diet. And, and you know, that, that's his woo, alkaline diet. I, I mean, it's blaming the victim. Basically, and the victim buying into that blame, saying, sorry, it's my fault. I didn't, you know, I gave up. This is my favorite picture of Robert O. Young <laughs> in a prison jumpsuit, <laughs> which is where he belongs. Unfortunately, it's by no means sure that that's where he's going to end up. I really hope he does, but it's still ongoing. Um, but, but, I want to finish just with these thoughts. The brain and body are part of the same organism. They are one. The mind is the brain. Now, none of this mind-body duality. There's a, ton, there's a ton of mind-body dualism inherent in these ideas. And, and at the risk of God, win, God winning it again, I, I think of it as kind of a triumph of the will idea. If your will is strong enough, if you want it badly enough, you will get it. Um, and the way you get it is placebo, epigenetics, or bringing out some healing energy from the universal source. <sighs> Unfortunately, you can't. I mean, think, did Kim Tinkham bring the disease on herself? No. Didn't she, didn't she want to live just as bad as any other cancer patient wants to live? Of course she did. Does her death mean that she didn't try hard enough? Of course not. It, she just chose poorly based on the human and childlike tendency that, to want the universe to give you what you want, and to want the universe to make sense all the time. Unlike what Deepak Chopra says though, there's nothing more natural than dying of cancer. But thanks to science, you know, I don't want to finish on such a downer note. Thanks to science, you're a lot less likely to die of cancer than you would be otherwise. Science-based medicine, surgery and chemotherapy suck, but they work and they'll get better. Or we'll replace them with something better that's not as toxic. That's how we get better, not by incorporating the secret into our medical practice. Thank you.